be a memory. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And our stories are written especially for people learning English. Word. Around the world, the coronavirus pandemic has made it difficult for companies to produce and for people to buy goods. As a result, the price of things like meat, cars, and fuel has risen. Something else is set to get more costly too: American colleges and universities. In all parts of American life, people are paying more for workers. Food and energy. As a result, colleges will also charge students more in the 2022-2023 school year. Jim Hundreiser is vice president at the National Association of College and University Business Officers. He said that for several years, college costs have increased somewhat slowly. But now he said, "There is absolutely going to be an increase in tuition and fees." The University of Virginia has already said it will raise its price for the next school year by almost five percent. Another school in Virginia, Virginia Tech, already raised prices for meals by nine percent to help pay the people who work at campus eating places. Along with the Virginia schools, colleges, including Loyola of Chicago, Texas Christian University, and the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, all said prices will go up next year. The price increases are a change compared to the last two years. The College Board reports that costs have not risen very much during the pandemic. But in the ten years before that, college prices spiked or rose sharply. During that time, the cost to attend public colleges rose twenty-eight percent. The cost for private colleges went up nineteen percent. The coming rise in prices is more noticeable because many universities felt pressure to keep prices down during and just before the pandemic. Those who run schools are worried that students who are in the middle of their studies may be surprised by higher costs. David Jewell is senior vice president for business affairs at Cleveland State University in the midwestern U.S. state of Ohio. The yearly cost to attend Cleveland State is about twenty-seven thousand dollars. The price includes tuition as well as estimated living costs. That is a lot of money, but it is less money than the cost of hundreds of other American colleges. Jewell told the Hetchinger Report that students who attend Cleveland State are often the first in their families to go to college. Many already have trouble paying for higher education. Even a small price increase for the next school year might prevent some students from attending. Robert Kelchin studies education policy and leadership at the University of Tennessee. He said universities might need to delay repairing school buildings, reduce some services, and increase class sizes to deal with their own rising expenses. Increasing tuition prices will not be enough. They have to look at other ways to cut costs, he said. Cutting services will be difficult, another researcher said, because current students need more than before from their universities. Some students, for example, want mental health services. 
one study by the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Minnesota found that two times as many students are depressed compared to the number before the pandemic started. About 1.5 times more students are dealing with anxiety compared to before the pandemic. And it is not just students who want more. Professors want to be paid better. So do graduate students who teach part-time. Some universities stopped putting money into workers' retirement accounts at the start of the pandemic. But they have started to do so again. Richard Garrett is a researcher at Ancora, a higher education advising business. He said universities and colleges are being pushed to spend more just when they don't have any more to spend. Some of the costs will be covered by states that are spending more on education. For example, leaders in Colorado, Kentucky, Missouri, and New York want to add money to the state's higher education budget. In California, Governor Gavin Newsom said he would add more money to the state's education budget as long as the cost of attending college goes down. California State University has already said it will not raise tuition costs at its 23 campuses next year. Jewel of Cleveland State said universities can get creative when trying to save money. They can do things like offer less costly foods at campus eating places. With all the cost cutting, there is one bit of good news. Universities may finally change the way they spend money. Large state universities that have several campuses may decide to buy items like computers and computer supplies through a central office. By making a large purchase instead of several smaller purchases, the universities can save money. The University of Massachusetts, which has five campuses, made this change in 2020. It already has saved $34 million. Some schools may feel pressure to change the kinds of classes they offer. Some will cut classes that do not have enough students. Others will use technology to do more teaching by computer and video, which is less costly than gathering students in person. Some schools may start new programs for high-demand subjects. Garrett, the researcher from Encura, said people have been slow to recognize a cost and productivity problem at universities over the last 30 to 40 years. Maybe what's happening now, he said, will make a difference. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Dan Friedel. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jill. And now, here is Brian Lynn with a story on Omicron in animals. American researchers say they tested a group of deer in New York City and found that some of them were infected with the Omicron version of COVID-19. The highly infectious version, or variant, was identified in the white-tailed deer population on the city's Staten Island. The Omicron variant was found in seven of the 68 deer tested between December 13th and January 31st. The results are reported in a study carried out by researchers at Penn State University in Pennsylvania. The study was financed by the United States Department of Agriculture, or USDA. Earlier COVID-19 variants were also found in white-tailed deer in New York and several other U.S. states. But the Staten Island study is the first to find evidence of the Omicron variant in deer 
or any other animal population, said Suresh Kuchapudi. He is a professor of virology at Penn State who led the research team. Kuchapudi told the Associated Press the finding opened up the possibility that, like the previous variants, Omicron can and has spilled over into animals. He added that for this reason, the presence of COVID-19 in animal populations needs to be closely watched. Kuchipudi added that the spillover of Omicron from humans to deer suggests the possibility that vaccine-resistant versions of the virus could mutate and spread in non-humans. When the virus completely mutates, then it can escape the protection of the current vaccine, Kuchipudi said. So we'd have to change the vaccine again. The researchers also reported that nearly 15% of the 131 deer captured on Staten Island had COVID-19 antibodies. This finding suggests that the animals had past coronavirus infections and they were reinfected with new variants. In August, the USDA said it found the world's first cases of COVID-19 in wild deer in Ohio. This expanded the list of animals known to have been infected with the sickness. The information was based on findings collected months before Omicron became the most dominant variant found in human populations around the world. So far, the USDA has reported COVID-19 in animals including dogs, cats, tigers, lions, snow leopards, otters, gorillas, and minks. I'm Brian Lynn. Thanks, Brian. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. February 14th is Valentine's Day in the United States and other countries. It is the day to express love and warm feelings for those important people in our lives. So today we will talk about an expression that is all about deep feelings. To pull at one's heartstrings. When something pulls at your heartstrings, it makes you feel strongly. It creates a deep well of emotion right in the center of your heart. Things that tug at our heartstrings also stir our feelings and emotions. They bring them to the surface. What kinds of things have this effect on us? Well, that depends on who you are. If you love a well-told story, a well-written book can pull at your heartstrings. A friend of mine loves art. Once I saw her crying in front of a painting. The colors, she said, really tugged at her heartstrings. People who love movies can have their heartstrings pulled by a good film. I love music, so for me, the right song or even the right notes will pull at my heartstrings. But we don't use this expression for all feelings. For example, anger is not an emotion that is connected to this expression. The feelings that are at play with this expression can be happy or sad. Usually, those emotions are ones of love, longing, or both. Sympathy, pity, or compassion 
are common emotions we think of when we hear the expression, pull at your heartstrings. Public aid campaigns and commercials often try to tug at our heartstrings. Think of seeing a puppy left out in the cold or an old married couple who can't pay for needed medication. Both of those examples try to tug at your heartstrings and your wallet as well. Now let's talk about some notes on usage. The verbs we often use for this expression are pull, pluck, and tug. Sometimes you might hear the expression said as to play on someone's heartstrings. But that is a little less common. Also, you don't always have to use the preposition at. You can simply say something tugs the heartstrings. And sometimes the word heartstrings is used on its own. For example, a critic might say a movie aims for the heartstrings, but misses, hitting the funny bone instead. Some word experts say that in medieval times, it was thought that heartstrings were tissues that supported the heart. So if you pulled them, you controlled the heart and the emotions. Now, here is the expression used between two friends. Did you see the new children's movie that just came out? The Long Lost Lonely Little Ladybug. That's a children's movie? It sounds so sad. It is. I watched it last night and I cried for hours afterward. That sounds awful. Oh no, it was just what I needed, a good cry. I'm still thinking about it today. <sighs> that movie really pulled at my heartstrings. I don't mind a good movie that pulls at my heartstrings. But it sounds like this movie pulled them right out of your chest. Maybe next time, watch a comedy. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Now, let's hear another story about Valentine's Day from Katie Weaver. Another Valentine's Day, pandemic style, is almost here. Some people will be heading to restaurants on February 14th for romantic but socially distanced celebrations. However, many of us will stay at home celebrating our loving partnerships as best we can. One way to make the day feel special is to think about your favorite foods and then add something unusual. Spend more than normal for a better cut of meat, rare spice, or sweet treat. If a high-end steak dinner is your dream Valentine's Day meal, you can bring it home. Porter Road Meats in Nashville, Tennessee, for example, offers dry-aged and hand-cut meats. The company's creators are committed to using only humanely sourced animal products. But maybe you favor seafood, like lobster. McLoon's Lobster Shack in Maine has a Valentine's Day deal for two. The restaurant will provide you with clam chowder, lobster rolls, and a heart-shaped blueberry bread pudding. The whole meal will take about 10 minutes to put together at home. You might want the meal-making to be part of the celebration, however. Blue Ribbon Sushi, based in New York City, will ship you a do-it-yourself meal kit 
with fresh fish, expertly prepared sushi rice, seaweed, and a bamboo bat for rolling. You can add other foods to this Japanese meal, like caviar, lobster, crispy rice cakes, and more. For morning people, maybe a fancy Valentine's Day breakfast is best. You can improve your eggs with a few pieces of crispy, costly meat, like that from Peter Luger's Steakhouse in Brooklyn. Or check out Billy's Bacon from Fairhope, Alabama. It makes thick cut pieces. Other high quality cooking ingredients might include special olive oil or balsamic vinegar. Valentine's Day can also be very simple but still special. Snuggle up and watch a rom com with your love. Make some popcorn. Makers Stone Hollow Popcorn sell it by the jar or in gift boxes. You can choose from several kinds of corn, including red, blue, and ladyfinger. And we cannot discuss Valentine's Day without talking about chocolate. There are several ways to go. You might treat your special people to some fancy chocolates, like the imaginative handmade mice with toasted almond ears from L.A. Burdick Company. Or consider the colorful love box from Aunt Sun's Chocolatiers. The treats are almost too pretty to eat. Madunu chocolates are made in Ghana. And the sweets are designed to honor African chocolate making traditions. Try their chocolate tasting kit for four with a flavor wheel, tasting mats, and more. Staying home for Valentine's Day sounds better and better. Let us know if you are planning anything special for this February 14th. I'm Katie Weaver. Thanks, Katie. Finally, Susan Shand brings us a story about new technology in the food industry. Technology companies are raising hundreds of millions of dollars to develop farm products that use microbes and seaweed to grow crops. The move comes at a time when fertilizer prices are very high. And increased attention is being paid to how food is produced around the world. Microbes, including fungi and viruses, have been available for years as treatments to protect plants from insects and disease, with mixed results. But developers are increasingly using them as natural ways to support crops while keeping up crop production levels. The new microbial fertilizers are sometimes called biostimulants. Such products could help farmers use less nitrogen. A fertilizer that can pollute waterways and create nitrous oxide, a gas that has environmental effects. Canada 
wants to cut fertilizer emissions by 2030, while the European Union aims to reduce fertilizer usage. Denmark-based Novozymes is one of the biggest sellers of biological agriculture products. One product contains a fungus that grows alongside plant roots and releases phosphate, a crop nutrient, from the soil. Yara International of Norway says its biostimulants are based on seaweed and other substances. Another product from the startup Pivot Bio has microbes that take in sugar from the roots of corn, wheat, or sorghum plant, producing an enzyme that changes nitrogen to ammonia, a crop nutrient. The California-based company says farmers use it on more than 400,000 hectares. It has also raised $430 million last year from investors. AgFunder says investments in biostimulant and crop control products have more than doubled in 2021 from the previous year to $777 million. And Rabobank expects the $3 billion biostimulants industry to grow by 12 to 15 percent each year over the next five years. Microbial fertilizers are largely unregulated, with few studies on how effective they are at developing crops, and not everyone is convinced biostimulants work. University of Minnesota soil scientist Daniel Kaiser tested Pivot's proven product over the past two seasons. He used them on six areas with reduced nitrogen fertilizer treatments, but only one area showed an improved yield. With a lot of these biostimulant products, the scientific principles are sound, but taking them from a concept to something that will work in the field, that's where they tend to fall apart, he said. Currently, only a small number of American states require companies to supply data on the effectiveness of microbial fertilizers and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has only issued draft guidance for public review. In Europe, the European Union will require data on biostimulants starting in July 2022. I'm Susan Shand. Thanks, Susan. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Some content in this program was provided by the Associated Press or Reuters News Agency. And don't forget to join us again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Ana Mateo.